All right, let's move on with our program right now. And the America's Future Series is now delighted to welcome back, yes, indeed, Zahir Ali. Are you there someplace? Yes, indeed. How about that? And uh, the Relativity Space gentleman that is uh, representing uh, Relativity Space is Tim Ellis. So uh, Zahir and, uh, and Tim, I guess we're going to have a little conversation. We like to refer to it as a fireside chat. Here in the middle of the summer, it's uh, 90 degrees here in Dallas, Texas today. But uh, hey, it says fireside chat, so we're going with it, fellas. Thank you again for being a part of this uh, America's Future Series. And uh, it's all yours. Take it away, gentlemen. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Murray, uh, it's just amazing because, you know, sitting here in the San Francisco Bay Area, fire is a little bit of a poor term to be banding <laughs> about right now. I hadn't thought of it I, when I termed this a fire. I understand. Site. Well, I totally understand. My daughter lives in, in uh, Santa Monica, down in the Los Angeles area. So I totally understand, have yes. heard a lot about all that you're having to endure. So please know our thoughts and prayers are with you all and uh, stay, you. stay safe, my friend. And, uh, and, and take it away. Again, we're delighted to, to welcome you on behalf of uh, America's Future Series. Thank you so much for being with us here on this Wednesday. Uh, thank you. And so we've got uh, Mr. Tim Ellis here, uh, co-founder and CEO of Relativity Space. Uh, it is the first uh, autonomous rocket factory. So we've heard amazing uh, discussion about um, the infrastructure of space. Uh, about how things are, are currently, uh, about a lot of the innovation, where we're going, particularly uh, in terms of uh, security and defense, and, but also in terms of commercial. We looked at things like bandwidth. We looked at uh, talent pipelines. Uh, now, one thing that we've been working on the edge of was innovation and entrepreneurship. And as you just heard from uh, uh, the generals and uh, uh, Ms. Miller, it, we, there are real efforts to bring entrepreneurship and innovation into uh, these systems that have existed now for almost 70 years uh, and to take advantage of them, to be more agile. And I think, uh, and I'm sure uh, you all will agree that uh, Mr. Ellis's company uh, represents almost an extreme version of that. So Mr. Ellis is a 3D printing uh, expert, uh, 3D printing additive manufacturing. Uh, he brought that in-house at Blue Origin, where he was uh, um, part of uh, propulsion uh, development. Um, and, but he, you know, since then he started uh, Relativity. He's uh, on the National Space Council User Advisory Group, um, World Economic Forum as a tech pioneer. Uh, just uh, so many amazing things. Um, and I will let uh, you, I will ask you, sir, to give us a little bit more intro and tell yeah. us about your journey and, yeah. and, and how it, it, relativity came about. Yeah, of course. Thank, thanks to here and everyone for your team and really, really excited to be here. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd really say it, it hired, like you mentioned, so just a quick intro on relativity, then I'll get into how we founded the company. But we 3D print entire rockets. So uh, I, I started my career at Blue Origin, working for Jeff Bezos' private space company um, back when they were only about 150 people. Um, so they're quite, quite large today. Um, first started as an intern in the propulsion group, where I would go from blank sheet of paper to first working version of a product and was fortunate because the team was so small to do all the steps in between. So design, analysis, manufacture, test, um, and, and you know, retest until you actually got a working product. Through that experience, I did the first ever metal 3D printing at Blue Origin. And then I, I was fortunate to, to work directly with Jeff and the senior uh, management team to bring metal 3D printing in-house once I was there uh, working full-time for a few years. Um, you know, put, spent, spent time on B4, New Glenn, um, but I would say predominantly the New Shepard uh, program there as well. Um, but, but what was really interesting, so as we started this metal 3D printing division, you know, th this was uh, back in you know, 2013 or so, um, and, and really lots of companies were doing 3D printing. So NASA was doing 3D printing, Aerojet Rocketdyne was doing 3D printing, SpaceX for the Dragon capsule program and Super Draco. So it was actually becoming pretty commonplace, but everyone was just doing bits and pieces of a product. And at the time, you know, it had been about 13 years into SpaceX, you know, sending cargo to the International Space Station and landing rockets and lots of really impressive achievements that I was personally inspired by. And I really felt 
making humanity multiplanetary was a very important long-term goal, but not a certainty that other companies would emerge to go after that. Like uh, all of the renderings and animations of launching people to, to Mars and landing were beautiful, but they'd always fade to black right when the people started walking out. And I really felt 3D printing, instead of just doing bits and pieces of a rocket, like wh why couldn't we just print the whole rocket? Like why isn't that the inevitable future? Um, and if we think of 3D printing less as a manufacturing technology and more as moving uh, manufacturing complexity from the physical world into software and uh, really creating a whole new value chain around 3D printing an entire product like a rocket, that this would be you know, valuable for actually building humanity's industrial base on, on Mars, but that even on Earth, we can actually get rid of all of the fixed tooling um, supply chains that are very complex, lots of human labor that are still, you know, 60, to 60 years later after uh, Apollo and the initial space race, and even in aerospace more broadly, still the tool set that we use today to build all of these products. So we founded Relativity in 2015, December 2015. I actually famously like sent a cold email to Mark Cuban. That was the first email I ever sent with my Relativity Space email address. Um, so he funded our, our first $500,000. Uh, and then from there, we've raised over $185 million um, actually building the world's first fully 3D printed rocket. Um, so we actually built the largest 3D printers in the world, um, of which we're on like generation you know, three to six, depending on how you slice it. Um, we actually have two launch sites. So one at Cape Canaveral, Florida, um, one right of entry at Vandenberg Air Force Base, where we're looking to launch our first rockets uh, towards the end of this year. And so we really see 3D printing. Now you, you touched. Yeah, yeah, we, re we really see 3D printing no, go on, please. is a whole new value chain, much like going from on-premise server to cloud or going from gas internal combustion engine architecture to electric. It just requires a very different thought process to build a whole product this way. The designs look entirely different and the factory that you need to actually produce something this way looks entirely different. So we had to start from scratch and build both the rocket and the factory at the same time in, in synergy together. And then we also um, really see a lot of benefits from that. So you know, we're, we're actually printing the first rocket now that we're gonna fly to orbit. I've done a whole bunch of development and engine tests and, and other parts of the rocket over the last five years. Uh, but then, you know, we also are seeing the ability to build a whole rocket from scratch in only about 60 days. Um, so raw material in the door and 60 days wow. later, it's complete. It has a hundred times fewer parts than a traditional rocket. Most of the complexity is in software. And then 60 days later, we can do a better version and 60 days later, a better version than that. So we're actually at this hyper evolvable iteration speed, um, which you know, we really believe will we'll build better products, um, not just for rocket launch vehicles, but aerospace more broadly in the future. So that you touch on a few things that are really interesting there. Now I, I went to Cal and, and that Cal, the tradition is that if you're an fi experimental physicist like I am by training, uh, you build your own experiment which meant that God, God bless them. They let me turn stuff on a lathe um, and let me get oh, qualified in the mill and all these other things. Right. And then yeah. I just remember how frustrating it was to have to take a part that I knew was actually fundamentally very simple to envision, but you have to assemble it from 15 different things. And, and I think of the first um, me metal 3D printed thing I ever held, which was uh, the, the chessman, the castle or the rook. Uh, as, as some people call it, on, on the end uh, of the board there. And they had little stairs going up the inside of it that I could shine a flashlight all the way up through. It was remarkable. I said, holy cow, you, this is like the, the videos of the guys with the little picks doing the ball inside of a ball, right? It's, it's, it's extremely, it's changing the way we can envision design, not just um, the manufacturer. So, so what, I, what I wonder is, right, when you think of ages of humanity, we name them after materials, right? Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. But at some level, what that tells you is what and how you make things, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I'm really curious as to how you see additive manufacturing, not just um, in terms of what it does for, for the rocket, but how is it going to change aerospace in general? And how do you see that yeah. enabling the commercialization uh, of space. 
Yeah, so, I mean, I think, great, great question. So I think the, I mean, the first thing is I strongly believe that additive manufacturing and 3D printing will be the most disruptive technology in our lifetime for aerospace. I think the, the way people should think about it is more transitioning from physical complexity to software or bringing automation into aerospace. So if you look at most other industries, it's, it's really interesting. DARPA has collected data over the last you know, 50, 60 years. There's plots you can go find online about it where they track uh, product complexity across different industries over time and then how many months it takes to design, iterate, and test new products. Um, so if you look at automotive and silicon fab and aerospace, uh, over the last you know, 60 years, all of them have gotten many orders of magnitude more complex with total part count and lines of code, um, which I think makes sense. But Silicon Fab has handled that very, very well. It's actually about the same you know, 20 months or so to design, build, and test today as it did 60 years ago. Automotive is actually about four times faster, and then aerospace is three times slower. So it actually looks- Oh, totally wow. Different. It's gone the wrong direction. Yeah, it's actually three times slower. And um, I, I think the reason for that is aerospace has not adopted automation. And I think there's a good reason for that too. I mean, th these are you know, rockets and aircraft and fighter jets and missiles. These are like very complicated products with hundreds of thousands to millions of individual piece parts. They're produced in some reasonable quantity, but you know, 50, 60 a month is still not the same as hundreds of thousands of cars per month. Um, and, and so there's really no answer for automation and 3D printing is actually automation for aerospace. So when you think about the hundred times fewer parts that we're able to do for a rocket, we have no fixed tooling at all. So all of the, the CapEx and factory we build for our first rocket Terran 1 is directly transportable to any other product that's of similar size and, and kind of scope uh, as a rocket. And, and so I think that's how additive is going to change the aerospace industry is that it's really uh, allowing you to actually bring automation into aerospace in one fell swoop, um, which is there has not been a great solution for before. Um, and of course, that's going to speed up the, the rate of innovation and I think solve that core problem that uh, DARPA has been looking to solve. Thank you. Tim, now I want to I want to change gears a little bit, or maybe kick it up a, a gear or two, yeah, and sure. zoom out from the factory, yeah. um, and and take a ride on that rocket that you're building, yeah. and yeah. and now look at at saying, okay, now we've talked about on Earth what this is going to do on Earth. Yeah. Um, what about and and this is similar to the question I asked the panel, um, my panel earlier about, okay, we're we're getting into refining how we get there. Yeah. Now it's going to turn into. How, what do we do there? How does it affect Earth? How do we do things in that space? We heard the previous panel discuss uh, at some very interesting length um, the, the space debris challenge. And then yeah. third of all, you know, how do we go, go past? How do we go to cislunar and past cislunar, right? You know, if we want to go do the, tr you know, we talk about trillion dollar economy in, in 10 years, right? If we go and pull down one asteroid with, with the right amount of lithium on it, that's a trillion dollars right there. Right, yeah. but 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 how do you get there, and and how, and where do you pull it down to? You don't want to pull that down to Earth. Are you going to pull yeah. it down to the <laughs> to Mars or the Moon? And how do you process it there? Right. So uh, you know, you you shared with me some some great uh, great thoughts when we spoke previously about that, and I'd love to, to, you know for you to share that kind of roadmap for how three uh, D printing is going to enable things in, you know in in or orbit where we have the challenges uh, of low gravity and then even off world on other worlds we still have low gravity issues different atmospheres temperatures and, and right. how you you see uh you know uh, uh additive manufacturing adapting to that and then enabling things like habitat and and process yeah no of course um yeah i think lo lots to talk about there i think i think the first thing is what what is inevitable and unlikely to change in the future um and so you know, with additive, and we even had this thesis back five years ago and we founded Relativity, um, you know, what's the ideal factory or where to actually build stuff on another planet, whether it's the moon or Mars or in space. I mean, it needs to be small, lightweight, so you could actually launch it there and land it on another planet. It needs to be able to produce a wide range of products with very little human labor and involvement. 
and have intelligence built in to adapt to probably uncertain conditions that, that will change because we don't have perfect data on it or can qualify systems on Earth. So, so you take all those parameters. I think those are very unlikely to change uh, with time, especially because human labor will be extraordinarily scarce on other planets or the moon or in space for, for a while. So all, all of those parameters describe a very intelligent 3D printer. And so that's why mm. you know, I, ah. I strongly believe that has to be what system makes that future happen. As it turns out, all of those parameters also define a pretty dang good business on Earth, too. So I, I think but there's right. a lot of good synergy to actually <laughs> get to that future. Um, you know, I, I think asteroid mining, yeah, you, you mentioned that. I just feel like the companies that actually launch stuff to space will be able to capture a lot of that value chain. You're, you're kind of seeing it now with SpaceX doing Starlink, um, of which I'm a big believer in, you know, building their own satellites, launching their own things, you know, building even bigger rockets that are cheaper and lower the cost to orbit. I think that trend will just continue. And, and I think, um, you know, launch vehicle companies it's a good place to start because it is one of the higher barriers to, to entry for the entire economy. Um, and, and once we get lower cost launched orbit, um, that will really open up a lot of possibilities. I think the other interesting thing with that, so, so, so those are some inevitable parameters, I believe, for building off planet. I think there's also inevitable parameters for things that fly. Like you actually hmm. want things as lightweight as possible right um, right that ten tends to involve fairly organic looking structural shapes that are highly algorithmically optimized via computer algorithms so there's um, a synergy there happening yeah, kind of between the organic be made, shaping yeah yeah they can only be made via 3d printing you also want to use the strongest possible materials um, which sometimes are very difficult to manufacture classically and then you add all of that up and it actually means every single version of the next rocket we make and the one after that and the one after that that weighs less and can actually carry more payload will take less time to print and thus be cheaper. So it's actually highly incentive aligned for any single product that actually uses energy and uses you know, propellant or even battery and electric, electric energy. You're, you're highly incentivized to make the product cheaper over time and have higher performance with 3D printing when you do it at scale for a whole product instead of just bits and pieces. Um, so, so yeah, I think all of that combined really gets you to, to capabilities that just won't exist. I think more, more concretely, uh, we're starting by launching satellites to orbit at relativity. Um, so we're now, to, to our knowledge, the most pre-sold rocket in history before ever flying to, to space as a company with Terran One. Um, we've got a few great customers. We've got Iridium, wow. uh, Telesat, uh, Spaceflight Industries, a company named Momentus, and then also MuSpace. Uh, and then we're, we're working with the, the U.S. government, of course, as well, and, and hope to be a, a great customer there, too. Um, but, but yeah, all, all of that is because we were actually able to, to 3D print a bigger payload fairing. Um, so last year, uh, you know, we had a few customer requests that physically did not fit in our old rocket design. So it's about 1,250 kilogram payload to, to low Earth orbit for $12 million. The payload fairing was a two meter diameter fairing, which did not fit the, the Iridium satellites, for example. And so we were able to print a three meter diameter fairing and increase the payload volume uh, to, to 2X the volume. And that required no fixed wheeling change whatsoever. We had to slightly tweak the diameter of the vehicle where the common dome was for the propellant tanks. All of that was done with no fixed wheeling change. And we had to rerun some coupled loads analyses and other sort of you know, guidance navigation control and trajectory analysis. But other than that, that was all in software. And we are creating the software for developing our rocket, knowing that those parameters will change too. And so actually, I mean, the, yeah, so, so that's it helps. Just, that's a remarkable, that, I'm sorry, I, that's just such a remarkable change loop. Let's let that sink in for every, for the audience, right? Okay, yeah. they, got, they changed the fundamental design and size of their rocket and created another one to test in a year. Yeah, actually it was like that's six just months. That's just amazing. That, it was about six, six months. months. Six months. Yeah. And that, that, 
six months. That that's like something you hear about in terms of like college projects, in terms of you know yeah. ah, we we did this on the fly. But no, no, they're actually going to launch this. That's that's just to, to me remarkable. I can't think of any anything else in aerospace that I've ever heard of at that scale that was done that quickly. Yeah. Um, and and, and just, you know, it, it's, it's just remarkable. Yeah, and ju just to anchor how much hardware we've built, so we've actually done over 400 engine tests to date, including turbo pump fed engines with 3D printed turbo pumps, combustion chambers, valves, the works uh, down at NASA's Dennis Space Center. So we have uh, about a third of all of the stands at NASA's Dennis, and they're, they're a great partner under a CSLA agreements um, to get to use them for the next 20 years or so. And that's where we do engine testing. We've also done stage uh, pressure testing. So actually printed these full scale, you know, seven and a half foot diameter, north of 20 feet tall uh, with liquid oxygen, liquid methane tanks, you know, nested inside of each other, all printed as one piece. Takes about 10 days uh, on one 3D printer that we, we built ourselves and done pressure testing and showed this, this technology actually works. I mean, we've done thousands of material samples. We're printing the first orbital flight rocket right now in the factory, uh, just, just outside the store. So yeah, it's um, been, been quite a journey for sure. It's been super fun and I'm excited to, to launch to orbit at the end of next year and then start launching customers from there. So you mentioned launching customers and you mentioned NASA and, and actually the U.S. government. Um, I want to ask you a question to relate some of our discussion back to the previous panels. How do you see the printability um, uh, of, of rockets uh, interfacing with defensive security? Um, and and one, one thought I had uh, is that one, uh, one program that I'm uh, working on, on helping out is, is uh, TCAT, um, which is uh, a tritable uh, asset, asset. Mm -hmm. So these are so these are things where you might use them ten or twelve times and then discard them, as opposed to um, a, a missile, which is clearly, uh, an ex you know, it's a one-time use, uh, versus something like um, an F thirty-five, which you know is gilded, and so you need to have that thing have a quite a long lifetime based off the cost. So I'm just yeah. curious how where you see uh, relativity and their capability fitting in. To that, to that defense and security ecosystem? Yeah, so I, I think to, to start, the, the biggest thing that we offer is you know, our Terran 1 launch vehicle. So being able to launch assets you know, rapidly, responsively, um, especially supporting disaggregated and proliferated constellations of, of spacecraft, uh, that, that's the primary way that we're engaging in today. Um, of course, the 3D printing and additive tech that we're building, I think, is of, of a lot of interest. Um, yeah, the, the interesting thing about it is not only is it pioneering and it's a new technology approach for building rockets, but it's directly transferable to a whole bunch of other products. And whoever develops it first, the rate of compounding improvement is going to be far, far faster than traditional manufacturing. Like when you really look at it over the last six years, traditional manufacturing, you know, we're still welding, forging, casting. It still takes a very, very long time to build something new. With 3D printing, it's so fast and how quickly it can iterate that, you know, whoever develops that capability first, I think will like improve on it even faster. So there's kind of this exponential growth and doing it first is important. So uh, yeah, we're, we're actually, you know, I think people have asked me for, for years, like, why, why 3D print rockets? Why not 3D print, you know, 737 airplane or, you know, fighter jets right. or missiles? Like, I do think there's other products out there. It's actually really about, you know, back to the lighter is cheaper is faster. You know, there, there's kind of the stack ranking of what are the highest dollar per pound products in the world by dry mass. And then 3D printing does the best of those, like a car that weighs 4,000 pounds and a rocket that weighs 4,000 pounds uh, actually takes the exact same amount of time to print. And clearly the cost savings on a rocket is far, far higher. Um, so for us, for comparable payloads at our, at our first rocket size, it's about three to four times cheaper uh, price for, for the same payload size. And it's about the same payload volume as, as Vega uh, over at Ariane Spa. So this gives you know, America and, and the US um, a capability that you know, just really doesn't exist with a, with a very commercial pricing. Um, and, and I think that's a huge opportunity for the US. And, and we've been very, very 
uh, kind of forward leaning on that. You, you mentioned I sit on the National Security Council User Advisory Group. I'm like definitely the youngest person there by two decades at least. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's it's a great group to to be a part of and and support the U.S. and be that voice of you know the next generation of space companies. Um, you know, I think it, it's worth putting out on our team. So we're a little over 200 people now. We've actually been able to attract a whole bunch of executives that have launched things to orbit before. So between our 200 person team, actually added it up the other day, we've launched over 5,000 uh, orbital missions between everyone. So it's like an average of, what is that like? I don't know, some, some huge number per person uh, have actually launched up to space before. More than 10, yeah. It's yeah, amazing. yeah, 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 quite, quite a lot, actually. And I think it's closer to 10,000. I just, you know, sandbag the number a little bit. <laughs> we can be conservative there, right? You know, you don't want to have to oversell it. Yeah. So, so st staying with the concept of, of, you know, it's an opportunity um, for America and, and its allies. Um, what, at some level, what, what you've done is you've com disrupted completely the supply chain. Yeah. Um, uh, right, you know, the supply chain and manufacturing. That, that, that's, fu that's kind of fundamental to, to the uh, additive manufacturing uh, value proposition. Um, yeah. how, when you look around the rest of the space ecosystem, what other opportunities uh, for innovation do you see that, that you know, you're not going to address, but you're like, wow, it'd be really great if somebody jumped in with something disruptive here, or, or hey, that's something disruptive that could be done over there. Of course, you're, you, you, you have a company you have to usher, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, so course. you're a bit busy. Well, well, what else would you see? Yeah, a lot of those issues are super important to the whole space ecosystem and, and you know, further commercializing space and, and you know, taking advantage of it as a, as a um, place to do business. So I think, yeah, the other rate limiting steps for the whole industry right now. Um, so I hear a lot about uh, spectrum rights and ways to, to you know, utilize the, the limited spectrum assets of space, especially with the, the continued rollout of 5G terrestrial. Rate. So I think that's a, a big thing where technology can play a, a role. There are different ways to do spectrum sharing, um, you know, and kind of dual, dual use spectrum and more efficient use of those electromagnetic waves. Uh, for communication to ensure lots of players are able to launch uh, satellite constellations into orbit and not interfere. So I think that's one key innovation area. I think another is around space traffic management. Um, so just tracking orbital debris, it's a little bit more on the regulatory side, but making sure that we do proactively have regulation for, for space traffic management and that we're actually thinking about this ahead of time so that we ensure, you know, much like I think there's you know, I don't know about today, but, you know, at various points uh, before COVID, there's something like, it's like between 100,000 or a million flights per day of aircraft over the globe. And that's all able to be co coordinated quite well. Um, where, it, you know, far fewer kind of space, uh, space satellites and then space objects a little bit more. But I, I think a way to actually coordinate all of that together effectively um, is is a huge rate limiting uh, step for the industry mm. to not figure it out. And then the, the last piece is just terrestrial, um, you know, tr terrestrial data architectures in the ground segment. Um, so actually, you know, whether it's phased array or other sort of low cost antennas and ways to actually connect uh, low Earth orbit constellations of satellites into the the wider. Uh, internet and, and network and, and preserve the low latency capabilities that these these uh, in space assets actually are, are capable of providing um, is something that I know, you know I certainly hear a lot of people talking about and I think s still has some ways to go to get to the, the very very low cost um, antennas that you know anyone could buy and put on their house. Very interesting. Now we've, we, I know we only got you for a few more minutes here, uh, uh, but I, my understanding is you have a rather critical meeting you have okay, to get I, to. I got so, uh, um, minutes. I'm, uh, I'm good. All right. Great, great, great. Um, 
Well, then I, I want to throw one question at you that's a little technical. It, it, it's, it's from the um, Q&A, and I know you won't be able to join us later for the Q&A session, so I want to um, answer uh, this, ask you this question now, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, it, it's, a, it's interesting. Um, the, the question is, how are sh acoustic shock and vibe requirements maintained with such rapid designs? Right. Typically, the launch vehicle imposes these requirements on the satellite, but it sounds like relativity space would do the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the, the short answer is so we do have a payload users guide, which we maintain very similar to any launch vehicle company that has all the shock vibe, um, you know, couple loads analysis, which is what we end up doing custom and stepping into with the customer as, as we get closer to signing the contract or, or bidding on a government award. Um, so we still do all of that stuff. I think the answer is today we uh, have developed our own software and approach, and we use some industry standard approaches to do that. Um, but over time, we actually uh, want to develop tools that will will do qualification, not just by having to qualify every single physical iteration that we build, but we actually have windows of designs where we mm -hmm. won't have to physically requalify, but we'll requalify through analysis or through similarity. Right. Um, right. I think that that's the, the vision is that we are able to qualify through similarity for a certain range of designs. So it's not like, I mean, I'm sure going from a you know three meter payload fairing to like a five meter fairing, for example, like that's going to be a pretty big re redo, pretty big, but yeah. the little shifts and changes, um, you know, we, we can be more flexible than a traditional launch company. Like we, we can and have done things like add stiffeners inside of a second stage and a payload adapter uh, fitting like path or you know specific features within a fairing for acoustic for specific customers and we can actually do that um, where, where that's just not possible uh, cheaply at least traditionally. Very cool. Um, so uh, one other question that uh, I, I had that we, again based off of some of our discussion is um, a little bit of advice to to other innovators and entrepreneurs yeah um, as sure. an innovator and entrepreneur yourself yeah. um, you know because yeah. right space is viewed as, as the domain of big budgets um, yeah and uh, so it can seem intimidating uh, you know you want to start a software company all you need is a laptop and a, and, and a few of your friends right and maybe yeah. some ramen right um, yeah. But but space <laughs> is a little different. Uh, so what what advice would you yeah. have to to help shape people's thinking about how to attack yeah. some of these opportunities as an entrepreneur? Yeah, it's, entrepreneur. it it is super capital intensive. Although it's funny, I, I talk with some of our Silicon Valley investors, and and I won't won't name names, but there are some companies that are widely <laughs> celebrated. When you actually look at how much equity they had to raise for the valuation, it's like way worse than SpaceX, <laughs> like way more expensive, actually. So, so I think you can be successful. Oh, by ratio, yeah. Yeah, by ratio, yeah, like the actual value creation, yeah. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, I didn't talk a ton about the entrepreneurial startup journey, but, you know, we started in Y Combinator. Um, so after Mark Cuban, we started in Y Combinator. I thought that was a fantastic experience. I'd, I'd recommend it to every single person that, that starts a company. It is very hard to get into. Um, but I think worth applying. But yeah, the biggest thing I've learned is just relentlessness. Like I think you have to be so gritty and so relentless to to make you know a startup like this happen out of thin air. And and there are lows and there are really hard times and you get rejected all all the time. Like you get initially people that won't join your company. You, you know investors. You have to talk to a whole bunch of people before you get investment. Um, but just not giving up and I think going after a big enough transformational opportunity um, I mean there's always a little bit of revisionist history I think that's worth pointing out in these these kind of you know fireside chats is like yeah of course relativity is on a great path to success so I can sit here and look back and you know revise what the history was like but I'll tell you from from memory like living it going forward you know I always believe that that you know we we could get there despite the odds but man there's yeah there's some times where it feels like you know no one's on your side and you just got to keep pushing through and and you know like passion really really matters there 
and I think really making sure that that you believe what you're doing is uh, you know an, an inevitable thing that needs to happen. You're just the company that's going to do it. Thank you, Tim, for your thoughts. And uh, I'll finish up with one last question. It's 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 not technical. It's not necessarily related related to space exactly, but it's a theme uh, of the America's Future series is about uh, leadership. Um, and leadership in, in technology, leadership in innovation, leadership in uh, maintaining uh, America and its allies in democratic preeminence uh, in, in technology and, uh, and security. And just, uh, you know, your thoughts on or advice to, uh, to any folks we've had. We, we, I know we have some, some younger people online, uh, especially uh, who, who are starting, who are closer to the start of their journey um, than, than to the middle, like, like you, or, or to the end. Uh, and like, and, and, you know, where they're the mentors, like, like uh, General Levy or General Radigi, you know, so if you could give any advice it being, having been through part of it and now growing still. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, take it yeah. I, I, I definitely want to strongly caveat with what I'm about to say that, uh, yeah, I know there are absolutely times and scenarios where lives are on the line and, you know, safety of the country or, you know, customer assets are on the line that cannot be replaced. So you've got to really, really get your stuff right. But I think in development and especially, you know, entrepreneurial development early on, not being afraid of taking risks and not being afraid of, of leaning in and failing quickly and then iterating from there. Um, I think, you know, I'll, I'll give a more concrete example, like for propulsion testing, um, you know, we, we've been fortunate across the 400 tests we've done today, not a single failure has happened due to the 3D printing technology itself, but getting an engine to work like takes a ton of iterations. I, I wouldn't say, you know, we've had anything that's like cr crazy catastrophic, but you know, you, you don't get the geometry right, the design right, like all the flow rates are not quite perfect. And so, you know, you, you in, instead of anal analyzing and using testing as a way to validate what analysis that you actually did, it's it, like nature is the best calculator. It's actually far better to get to hardware, test and get the test data and then iterate from there. And, you know, I tell our team this all the time, we're in the business of taking smart risks. I, I think that's where people, in my opinion, need to tune their thinking a bit more is that, um, you know, risk and failure isn't bad if all of that happens faster and actually gets you to a place where, you know, break breakthroughs and, and compound rates of progress can happen more quickly. And, and I think, you know, on a national level, you certainly see that with, with, uh, you know, countries like China, they're, they're actually, in my opinion, reckless and kind of doing crazy stuff uh, to, to develop fast. But, um, you know, I think some of that rate of iteration and innovation, I think, is what, what's important for us to, to keep accelerating towards. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, yeah. You know, as an experimentalist by training, uh, you, that's music to my ears, because uh, at some point we, we stop wanting to do math and, or talk about it, and we just want to go blow it up. Uh, so, yeah, uh, although, yeah. of course, in, in the space industry, that's not necessarily what you want to have. Yeah. Happen, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, with, yeah, with there's, there's, there's <laughs> yes, That's yeah. Right. To, to be right. clear, I don't want to take taken out of context, but I think in the development phase, in you know certain phases where it's appropriate, it's just good to know and have good judgment. When is that appropriate and when is it not? I think is I'm a hardcore engineer by background, but I've had to learn you know the business, uh, like finance, legal, HR, recruiting you know, all of that stuff from scratch. So I just think the rate of learning needs to be very, very high. And I think you need to be super open-minded to having a growth mindset and understanding that you can learn new things. You can take risks and, and especially those areas and put yourself out there and then fail quickly and then keep, keep going. So I think, um, yeah, it's not even the technical areas always, but even just running a business and getting it off the ground, I think leaning in, and not being afraid to fail um, and then having resilience. Like those two qualities I've seen and had the good fortune of meeting lots of very successful founders. We've got a few great people like John Collison from Stripe is an angel investor in relativity of men for a number of years, um, you know, various other company founders and they all have that quality pretty similarly. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, uh, for your impressive uh, work and, and thoughts. Uh, you know, it's been an amazing day. We've heard uh, from, from folks who are operational now uh, to all the way to, you know, you who are helping uh, write the next chapter uh, of America's uh, presence and, and leadership in space. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be looking for the press releases uh, about your upcoming launches, hopefully, very soon. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, thanks, Sahir. Yeah, appreciate for uh, for having the time. And yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch after, I, I know I can't make the Q&A, but just send, send any questions my way. I'm happy to answer. I'll, I'll take them and, and shoot them over to you. Thank you so much. Okay. And well, with that, uh, I think our, our formal program is complete. I'm going to toss this back over to uh, uh, Murray Studios, uh, to David and Scott. Thank you so much. Hello, Zahir. Um, so I think we had a couple of people uh, from the earlier two panels that were going to join us again and do some Q&A. Is, is that correct? You had a couple of people from your class yes, last panel? Yes, we've uh, still got uh, Shelly still on, uh, as well as uh, uh, Mr. Shepard. And I believe um, uh, we might have a few couple people send me notes that they're going to try to drop in. Uh, they, they had to go take other meetings, and then we're going to try to pop back. Well, we won't keep Shelly and Tim too long, but we, do have, we did have a couple other questions that were brought to us via chat, et cetera, that we've sort of uh, written down uh, from our audience. And so I'd like to maybe ask one of those uh, while we're waiting for Shelly to come on. Um, but ultimately, you know, um, this group is about moving the needle and changing things uh, in a way, in a positive way, so that um, our military is uh, able to... Um, do its job better. We want to help modernize our military. This space discussion is absolutely critical to that. United States' ability to compete, our overarching theme, you know, is U.S. global competitiveness and national security. Um, we're really looking for things that game-changing ideas, ways of working together, what would uh, help um, our major defense contractors, the universities, and the DOD work together better. These forums are nice, but if we were to change something, especially around the way we're doing these, we're looking for feedback. Um, one of the questions was, you know, we've, we've had a conversation here. We're asking, how can we make them more interactive? How can we make these conversations more at a discussion amongst uh, folks like you, the people with the, with the brains and the answers? We just want to facilitate that. What can we do? You've been in a number of these conferences, a number of these kinds of discussions. From your perspective, Tim and Shelley, what can a group like ours do better to facilitate discussion amongst the panelists when they're on a, when they're on a camera, uh, like, like we are here. Any recommendations on how to make these things more interactive and come up with more concrete solutions and recommendations? I'm gonna let Shelly try that one. Well, thank you very much. Um, I actually have to say, this has been a fabulous format. You have been communicated well with us. You helped us understand how we could help promote the event and reach out to individuals that would find this panel exciting and interesting and the day interesting. Um, I found the interactive Q&A very interesting even during the panel. All my fellow panelists were very excited to be on it and shared great knowledge. So I guess that's my nice way of saying you did great and I don't know how to help you improve. I'm sorry. Well, if you do, or if anyone does, please, please let us know. One thing we want to do is, Shelly, you know, your events that you're having, you're having cyber, uh, you're having um, virtual events like this. Uh, we want to be a supporter for you, and we want to help promote your events. Uh, we would love to have people like Tim <laughs> join you and that like that. So if we can help uh, bring those people to you, we'd like to. Um, how can people uh, outside of the America's Future Series uh, connect with you at the Sp Space Foundation and support the work you're doing? If they want to be a speaker, a panelist, if they know someone, a sponsor, sponsors are nice, right? Um, how can they connect with you? Absolutely fantastic. And again, the great work we do at the Space Foundation, we are a nonprofit 501c3 for space-inspired education. So if people want to uh, participate and partner with us, whether it's on our Center for Innovation and Education and creating that robust uh, workforce pipeline. We have great programs. We have an endowment that we use. And then obviously for Space Symposium, both the in-person as well as our Symposium 365 virtual component, people can reach out to me right at Space Foundation. Um, you can go to our website or you can reach me directly at sbrunswick at spacefoundation.org. And I've already had about 30 people since our panel reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. And I'll, I'll load all of that in the Q&A box. And 
we're always willing to listen. We want to partner with you. We welcome your thoughts on what are some of the ideas we should do over the next few months. Because again, space is an exciting place. There's lots of opportunity. And, and how do we make sure we can bring the innovators and entrepreneurs together uh, to create those great breakthrough technologies that we need? And then also, how do we create that robust workforce pipeline that, that will be there to fill the jobs that we need? Wonderful. So I, th I think we'd all agree if we could be physically together in a room, that would be beneficial, right? Uh, so this is a next best surrogate. You know, it's, it's, it's a close, almost the same, and we're trying to maximize that and we're learning from it. But we will have a series of events in March that we'd like to invite both of you to be involved in. It will culminate on March 17th, which is St. Patty's Day, with a physical event um, so that we have an uh, we'll have an excuse to drink some green beer uh, be in dangerous. D.C., uh, it's going to be on a ship. It's going to be on the Odyssey 3, which goes up and down the Potomac. And General Mattis, General Petraeus, and General McChrystal are all going to be part of that for an awards dinner. We're honoring uh, General McChrystal in person. So that will be the first time we've been back together in person. We're hoping that you all will be able to come to that. You know, some of you can come to that live. And in the days leading up to that, we're going to have four events. We're calling it the Land, Air, and Sea, uh, Land, Air, Sea, and Space Symposium. And we will be talking about space. So we're going to have another day like this that we would like you all to be involved in. And if you have any recommendations on people uh, that you think um, the world should hear, we, uh, we want to provide that forum. So uh, be on the lookout, go to the America's Future Series, start looking at those dates. Uh, uh, March 17th is our culminating date. And uh, I think it will be great if we could all physically be together, people get to know each other, et cetera, um, you know, before the event and, and maybe uh, during the event as well. So anyway, Bringing well, your captain's half for the boat. <laughs> yeah, wear an ascot, please. <clears throat> So I'll add, um, frankly, right now, I'm a student at your knee because um, those of you who heard our panel, one of the things that we've talked about or I talked about was the uh, engagement of an ecosystem, both at the University of Colorado level as well as generally with the supply chain. And what you're doing right now has really helped me get my head around an intractable problem. I've wanted to set up a series of pitch days that are coached, um, reaching out to sort of like the, the UC system. There are many different campuses that have their own business schools and engineering programs thinking through like, how do I join uh, my LM fellows with those teams of people to get them all together? Because to be blunt, a lot of that takes place in a very Montessori way. It's gotta be in a sandbox and like physically moving those right. blocks around. And I have been struggling to figure out how do I do this mission of outreach to the community in a manner of this you know, disembodied moment. And what I'm learning from you is how to run a, a panel. Um, I probably will be coming back to you to be blunt, to understand better how you've organized things because you make it look simple, but that says that there's a tremendous amount of effort that comes into it. Effortless success is never that, right? I'd also give a shout out to uh, some of folks in your back room. I think it was David Hamilton who actually reached out and was very uh, persistent and gave us a lot of information about how to make sure we are dialed in on time and be connecting with you. Also, uh, Zahir, you ran a fantastic and a tight panel. Thank you. Um, that also helps a lot to keep the cadence going and to weave together the various thoughts. So in all those contexts, I say thank you. Um, and rather than actually presume to tell you how to do this better, I'm going to be coming and showing up asking how I can set up my own. So, so I think the answer well, we'd love is to have you back in March. Yeah. Yeah, we want to partner with you and everyone else. So the America's Future Series really doesn't have an axe to grind or a, um, a particular point of view. We're just a forum. And so everything we do is joint. So our joint military pitch day, which is the 26th of this month, is all branches of the military. It is all of the DOD uh, innovation groups like DIU, AFWorks, AAL, ONR, NFX, all those. So all of those groups will be tech scouting and evaluating pitches. And we have 110 companies that are pitching all above the, st um, the uh, startup stage. So these are people that are more than just a PowerPoint presentation and a good idea. They have a product, they have some IP, they have, may have some clients. Uh, maybe they've been get, gotten an SBIR grant, that sort of thing. We have 110 of those pitching in front of the military and the DOD, as well as angels, VCs, private equity firms, and family offices, along with the venture um, groups inside of the major defense contractors. So um, you know, almost every major defense contractor or medium-sized ones has a sort of a VC, has a, a tech scouting group. 
So we've opened this up to everyone. It's uh, open to everyone. People can see these pitches before the event. They can see the highlighted ones, the 50 that are gonna get showcased. They can go into our repository and see all of the pitches at a later date if they like. And we're trying to grow that as much as we can. If we could work with a, a group of universities, and much like there used to be something called Moot Corp back in my day when I was in MBA school, it was sort of the international case competition. But this is sort of a, a Moot Corp where you don't win prizes, you win business. Um, we're not given 10,000 or 1,000 or 500 bucks because you had a great idea. Winning means we've connected you with somebody who can fast track you through this process or connect you with a major player uh, like yours, Tim, and that who can bring you to market faster. So, so music to my ears. And I would actually just say at that moment, um, we'd like to slipstream in. Uh, Chris Moran is a vice president of LM Ventures, one of my colleagues. And uh, we, we do exactly this. We, we try to bring together for our own internal cognizance of the companies that we have stakes in and that we're trying to foster. I think what you're talking about, we gain a tremendous amount of interest from us. Um, I think that would also, if there's a possibility of pulling in the communities that we actually interact with, for instance, on the front range, would just be fantastic. You, you, you had us at hello. Absolutely, that's a McGuire moment for us. And uh, of course we have a long history with uh, uh, Lockheed. Marilyn Houston is one of the first people we ever honored with the Five Star Award. Jeff Babion we know, uh, Rick Edwards, uh, Orlando Carvalho. So over the years, Lockheed has been a big supporter and involved in our events. So has Raytheon and all the other large folks uh, who are our sponsor today. We would love for you to be involved. And what's critical is that we will craft it in a way, we don't have a set notion, you tell us how this should work and we will set the stage the way the participants want it to be set. Right. So that's our little pitch and, and uh, I think a sales pitch for the day. We'll be done on that now. <laughs> yes, David sir. Hamilton, the one and only. <laughs> well, yes, round of applause, please. Thank you. Virtually, you can't hear it, but trust me, they're out there clapping their the heads. The crowd up. is going wild, I understand. <laughs> they're standing there. It's unbelievable. And of course, uh, <laughs> Selflessly, I'll, I'll, I'll give a plug for, uh, for Murray Media. Oh, you need to do that. Yeah, our, our studios here have, have kind of changed, television production company. We can't, uh, you know, social distancing and all that good stuff. So we're not going to places for events, for big hotels and ballrooms. But we are here in our studios that we've just created. And uh, people like America's Future Series and our good friend David Hamilton that uh, have been involved for a long, long time. Yeah, we don't uh, want to say the year because it makes us really dated. It hates <laughs> yes. us. But Murray Media Studios at murraymedia.net. Easy to remember. Streaming, virtual production, you name it, we do it. And we'd love to be a part of whatever you're doing. Certainly the military. As we mentioned earlier, we've been to a 75th anniversary. We were in Pearl Harbor, the 70th anniversary of, uh, of uh, Normandy. We were over there uh, at the Omaha Beach and what have you. So anything to do with our military, we are there. And certainly anything to do with uh, America's Future Series. So enough on my big plug here, well, but no, we I, will do I, anything. I got I to say this, guys. You understand, if you want to put on an event like this and you need to be able to have this kind of production uh, capability and you need the back office stuff, like uh, Tim was saying, it's a swan, right, on the top of the water and it's a fast feet going underneath. Um, if you need that, Murray Media can do this. Scott historically did 600 plus events a year, charity events where he emceed them a year. Uh, COVID has changed that. That gave him too much free time. <laughs> so with that free time and his team, they have now pivoted and do a magnificent job on the video, uh, on the, on the tele uh, video teleconferencing side. So uh, help you create a podcast. He'll put these events on for you. I have to plug him because he does most of this stuff for free. Yep. I have no choice. I have no choice, but knowing what his mission is and what, uh, what he has created, I would, I would be there day and night. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted and most honored to be a part of it. And certainly with all of you too, thanks for all that you do. Really. We have had some, some rock stars, every one of them, such a rock star in their own right here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the general is back with us. Hello, general. Great to see you too. Hello, Harry. You're on mute. You're still Sorry, on mute, Harry. General, you're on mute. General. Yeah, I never left. Uh, I've been here for the full event, and uh, I just thought uh, it was uh, it was spectacular. And uh, I agree with you about the swan or the duck or whatever it was, because some of us have been uh, on the surface of the water and paddling as fast as we can. And uh, uh, we need to uh, point out Michelle Pearson, uh, who has not been on here uh, today. Michelle. You have not seen her. Make her come, come up. Here. Please, please come she up, She said Michelle. she wouldn't, but we're going to make please, her, right? Right, right on, here, Michelle. front and center. 
she's been uh, up you can take front, seat. Come front and center right there. She has been with yep, us and putting this thing uh, together Go around and, sit down. Uh, and working so uh, diligently on this. So we got a number of other events coming up as uh, David has already uh, talked about, but there's smiling Michelle. Uh, I hope you got a little bit of sleep last night because you had about three or four or maybe more nights you didn't get any sleep, but uh, to have such a successful program as as this has been, uh, Michelle, we owe you and David and and, and everyone here yep. uh, a, a great round of uh, thanks and applause. And I think Max Hamilton also. And maybe you want to introduce your team, Michelle. Over. Um, um, Max and Carolyn, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You, you took me off guard, um, General Radigui. So thank you so much for your kind words. It's been an honor. It's been a true honor. I mean, this man right here, I'm trying to get here. My business partner, amazing man. I have just, it's just been such an honor to work with him and the American get him in camera shot. What's that? Come on in here, David. Come on, David. Get him in the camera Stand shot. with me. We're business partners, right? Right? Okay. So, um, no, it's just such an honor. What he has built is just amazing. Um, General Radigi, you've been awesome. Uh, Zaire, General Levy, I mean, Scott and Doug, and in, in there's uh, um, David's son, Max Hamilton, and his girlfriend, Caroline Stevenson, and Taylor, I have to name them all. Yeah, Lucinda. Lucinda and Kathy, and my son, Nathan, Scott, and Prescott. Um, we should have had a name. Next time we'll have names, but. But no, it's just been, events, yeah, we have more events. Come and come and see us. And um, it's just been such an honor. And all of our speakers, thank you so much. Shelly, it's been an honor to get to know you. And, and thank you, Tim. I haven't met you yet, but thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom. And, and the whole entire day went fantastic. I could not wish for a better day. So thank you very, very much. So now the virtual happy hour will be, you guys have to BYOB. <laughs> yeah. Say goodbye. <laughs> I went virtual happy hour. I took, I took my tie off. Uh, Take your hat and get that yeah. glass of wine. Yeah. Enjoy. Y'all have a wonderful evening and thank you so much. All right, well, thank you, Shelly and Tim, for hanging out. Yes, we'll be in touch. Great, to, great, great to have you folks with us. Thank you, General. You bet. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you.